You were there two years, Supreme. Year and a year and a half. So uh, was the first year cool? Um Nah. It was pretty much um It was pretty like a struggle from the beginning. Really? Yeah, yeah. And in what way? Things started to you know what's that game where like the things pop up and you gotta hit them whack-a-mole whack-a-mole it was a whack-a-mole it was a, it was a whack-a-mole situation so they weren't allowing you to be the creative person you wanted to be no not 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 at all the tour ratio okay though the tour ratio okay though that might be the best question i've ever been asked <laughs> You're a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. Tremaine Emery is a major designer in the fashion world and an artist in general. He's got a label called Denim Tears, but you might know him because he had a recent battle with Supreme, where he was the creative director, and then he resigned after alleging systemic racism at Supreme. But this happened in the midst of him working with a major artist on a line that would include images of black people being lynched, a black man who was whipped, very controversial, polarizing stuff. So I wanted to talk to him about what he did at Supreme, what he was planning to do, everything that happened, and his entire artistic journey. This is a man who's worked in many, many areas of the fashion world, including working with Yeezy on clothes and albums, worked with Virgil Abloh, incredible career. Let's get into it. It's Tremaine Emery on Touré Show. What I love about what you do is you you speak through fashion, right? You, yeah. are, you are creating culture and your voice through fashion, which is completely foreign to me. Mm -hmm. If you gave me a t-shirt and said, say something, I would not know how to speak in that way. Yeah. How did that language just develop for you? Um, great question. I learned from, man, I'll tell you, I started like this and I've told this story before. When I was six years old, my parents took me to this pet store on Northern Boulevard. And they're like, we can get you a cat. And the cat was a calico, calico cat. So calico cats, if you, anyone doesn't know that's watching, is they're basically like patchwork cats. And like black and white. Black, white, gray, gold, stripes, spots. And um, they're like, you got to name her. And within... Two seconds, I said her name's Fashion. I was six years old, you know, because she reminded me of one of my mom's dresses or, like, my mom's fashion magazines that she used to read and stuff, you know. So that's six years old. So then I think it started with um, my parents' style and my um, the style of all the people down in Harlem, Georgia, where I used to spend my summers, um, which is uh, 20 miles from Augusta, small one red light town. Then, it, you know, like my Uncle Ray... You know, my cousin Anthony, who he um, he used to live in Japan because my uncle Nelson, his father, and his my aunt San, he was stationed in, the, I think, the Air Force in Japan. So, like, Anthony had, like, a mama-san, papa-san. So when, when he moved to Harlem, Georgia, he was older, about 10 years older than me. I always, like, make him show me all his um, ephemera from Japan, anime, Gundam, different anime movies, clothing and stuff you have from there. And also Anthony just had great great style. Um, yeah, rest in peace to Anthony. I miss him. Mm. He, he died like when he was like 38, like 10 years ago, 2010. But, um, he had, you know, so that the style started from like family members. My Uncle Ray, so cool, had great style. So it started for me with style. Then it progressed to the storytelling started with my parents owned a video store called Just Us Videos okay. in Elmhurst, Queens. And 
the Deep Hood in East Elmhurst in the 80s. And, um, you know, like Coogee Rap, Salt and Pepper, all those people used to come and buy oh, wow. rent tapes from my parents' video store. And then, um, like, Kid and Play, Play mm -hmm. worked there. He oh, actually, wow. So my first understanding of design was from Play because he designed the... Um, the shirts, the t-shirts for us. Cause Play went to, he went to fashion school. He was a fashion designer as well as a musician. And I remember my parents even like, I think they fired him cause they're like, you need to just go do your thing or something. Wow. I think that's how the story goes. My, my, da my dad would have to confirm it. So, and then me and Kid used to get our hair cut at the same Dominican barber. And um, those guys had great style. All the people that came in, the style, but also the storytelling from movies and the style in movies. You know, I've probably watched thousands of films, thousands. What are the films that really jump out for you as far as style, uh, fashion? Chinatown. Okay, Jack Nicholson. Uh, yeah, Chinatown. Like even now I got like a, a guy that makes my suits and um, I'm always like, yo, Chinatown fit, that type of fit. And then um, what else? Uh, Popa, the Popa Greenwich Village. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Um. You know, so many films, you know, like Bruce Lee films, hmm. um, Dolomite and all that black exploitation stuff. For sure. Then, um, very stylish there. You know, Spike. Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. You know, Spike. Early Spike, middle Spike, or later Spike? Early Spike. Actually, you know, the film She's Gotta Have It. Yeah. For sure. Um, Spike. Asked my father, my parents to invest because Spike <laughs> knew of my dad through this guy that helped my dad get a job at CBS. Okay. Because my dad was a TV news, he's a retired TV news cameraman. Okay. Emmy Award winning TV news cameraman, Tracy Emery. And um, that's why we moved to New York because he got the job at CBS oh, through, wow. through affirmative faction, oh, wow. which is that's full yeah. circle for this conversation. For sure. Where this for conversation's sure. going. Um, and through affirmative action, he needed a firm of action to get his job, even though he's Emmy Award winning TV news cameraman. Wow. And um, had, a, you know, the highest discharge you could get from the Army. That's where he learned how to shoot wow. motion pictures. Wow. You know, he was a, he was a Mopic cameraman for the, in, the, in the Army and um, did all types of missions, you know, top secret missions, whatever, film and stuff. So then um, just watching those films, yeah, Spike Lee films. You know all those films, westerns. You know, once upon once upon a time in the West. From your references, I feel like we're about the same age, right? Like, I'm 42, so I'm a little bit younger. A little younger than yeah. me, but similar references. Yeah. I, I when I feel like when I was in my formative years, as far as teenager, early mm -hmm. 20s, the idea of a black man being a fashion designer was like, what are you talking about? Like I might also be a, a a gymnast, right? Like, but that you saw that was possible for you. Yeah, because because of my parents. Um, my dad used to, you know, when I'd like be able to finagle my mom into buying me some designer stuff, like I don't know, hill figure. I started working young. Like my first job was like twelve, cutting lawns. My dad mm. taught me how to cut lawns. And he's in like, Queens, well, yeah, in Queens for so, sure. And he, he walked to people's houses like, you can hire my son. He'll do a good job. That was my first job. Then I worked at Baskin Robbins. This is all as a teenager. But um, my dad used to always tell me, like, put put your own name on your jeans. This is from I'm little. Wow. Because he, he always knew I was into clothing and style. So from a young age, he's like, you should put your name on your jeans. And I remember my first pop my first pop up was with No Vacancy In, which is a um, brand and a crew that me and my friend A-Side um, started together, and then my friend um, Brock joined. Our first pop-up was at, in 2015, I think, and Tom Sachs did a thing at his studio, and he had different artists come do insta um, installations at his studio, mm -hmm. and you could sell stuff. And he created a, a, a bodega that was also a boom box, so you could play music out of the bodega. Crazy. And you could sell stuff, pardon me. And I remember my dad came to it and he's like, Tremaine, boy, I told you, I told you to put your names on the clothing. And we had made t-shirts and hoodies. So he's encouraging you from very early oh, age. Oh yeah, my parents from- That's very visionary too. My dad used to, I used to be brushing my teeth. My dad would be like, there's 
art to you'd be like, there's an art to everything, Tremaine. Even brushing your teeth and then walk Aww. out the bath and then walk out the bathroom. Oh, you know, my dad was like, not was he still is. Uh, always told me to think for myself. He said, even question what me and your mom tell you. Wow. Question everything, even wow. what we tell you, and make a choice based on your filter, what you want to do, what you want to say. You know, even when I graduated high school, I'll never forget he was sitting on a stoop at our house. And he was like, congratulations, proud of you. He said, if you want to make a lot of money, go work in finance or something. If you want to be happy, figure out what you love and try to do that as a profession. Wow. So that's always, and my mom was, you know, on the, on the, on the same tip. She wanted me to, she wanted me to finish school, which I didn't finish. I didn't finish college. Um, I remember even the last conversation I had with her, I was working as a, at that time, I was assistant manager at the Mark Jacobs store, collection store in London. And the last time I spoke to her before she passed, she was like talking about it. And she's like, do you think there's any way if you went back went back to school that you could get a higher, a bigger position at Mark Jacobs? And I just, <laughs> I, ch I chuckled on the phone. I said, mom, you know, I figured out some things. I'm working with this guy, Frank Ocean, working with this, um, me and Asai, we're working with ASAP Rocky a bit. I'm working with this guy named Serge Becker, um, consulting for him for his um, his um, venues in in London, and I'm working with Stussy, you know, as consulting for them on design and and and, mar and marketing Coming and up. parties. But this is very early, and I said I think I figured figure something out. I think I'm I figured something out, and then um, she said only thing my mom said was I'm happy you've figured out how to make a living doing what you always love. Because she knows I've always been into music and art. I've been obsessed with art my whole life because of them, because of them taking me to museums, you know, taking us to, you know. My mom would always, was an avid reader, and she'd be, always read the newspaper. She'd be like, hey, Pavarotti, Pavarotti's playing for free at Central Park with the Harlem Boys Choir. We're going to see it, you know. I didn't, I never seen opera. And I didn't even, so to see Pavarotti but singing with these, all these black black boys, the choir was incredible for me. And, you know, it was totally different than my experience in Jamaica, Queens. So our weekends were always adventurous. And, um, you know, turn that TV off, get outside. Yes. You know. But, yeah, the storytelling from the films and the style. And then, um, and then I'd say after that, um, then growing up in Jamaica, Queens, at that time in the night in the nineties, you know, it was just like, you know, LL was from three blocks away. Oh well. Wow. Um Tribe Called Quest was from down the down the block. They're from farmers. Um farmers over that side, farmers in, in Linden. Run DMC and that. Um Run DMC was right near there by Hollis. <laughs> then there was all the local local the local local yokel acts. Mm -hmm. And then um I'm 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 leaving out there's so many sure. musicians. Um, and then also St. Albans had the history of like, stop, Miles Davis used to live in St. Albans. Right. Um, so many, there's like, where the Long Island Railroad is, there's these two murals of all, because St. Albans was this amazing, one of the most prosperous middle class, black middle classes in America until sure. the crack epidemic happened. For sure. And so that's why my parents, my parents, we moved there because my parents couldn't afford um, a, um, a, um, a house, nor could they really. I remember when my dad told me this story. We went to go see. I remember we went to go see a film, and before the film at Lincoln Center, they had call us if you want to rent an apartment, get a house. My dad was like, "Yeah, right." He said, "Tremaine, when I was your baby, when you was a kid, and I was trying to find a house for us to live in, I'd call places and they'd hang up on me." Yeah, because sure. I was. My, his voice. For sure. So he had a Southern voice and a deep black man voice. For sure. They just hang up up to him. So the place yeah. that we finally got in Flushing, my dad called. I remember the guy's name was Mr. Lee. He said, do you do you rent out to niggers? That's what Your my dad, dad said. He said, do you rent out to niggers? And the guy was like, well, I, I rent to everyone. And that's how we got our house because my dad, we were running out of time. Right. And my dad couldn't even get a meeting. This is the eighty. This is this is the eighties yeah. oh, sure. in New York, late eighties. He couldn't even get a meeting to rent a place. So then we lived in Flushing, and they couldn't afford a house in Flushing or Bayside, Queens, or anywhere. So we, that's why we moved to St. Albans to the hood. 
You know what I mean? It was the real hood. I remember, I remember the first the first day we moved, the weekend we moved there. My dad said, like, "I don't want to see you on that corner because um, right. the the Jamaican spot got shot up. A few people got killed. This is my block. You know what I mean? And um, not and I didn't listen. I did hang out on that corner, but that was like our first weekend. I remember we seen the guys ride down on a BMX with a smoking. The one guy was on the pegs with a smoking gun. You know what I mean? Damn. And um, yeah, but these guys, you know." And it was all kinds of stuff happening like that there. And then, um, but it was also, my hood was like, it was like Boys in the Hood mixed with the Sandlot. Okay. So like lo- loads of fun, but also like always this air of danger. So you were, till recently, the first first creative director, right? Yeah. Of Supreme. Yeah. Right. Not just first black creative director, first creative director that they had ever had, right? Yep. On paper, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. How did you get the job? Because you had Denim Tears mm-hmm. rocking, right? You clearly had a name in the industry, but I mean, like, this, this is a huge job. Um, I think the guys who brought it up, this guy named Julian Kahn, who's like kind of like chief of staff over there, and then another guy named Kyle Demers. I've known those guys a long time. And they seen my, and then I know James Jebbia a long time as um, casual acquaintance. And then, then we began working together. But, you know, they watched, probably seen, they seen my career from even before I knew I had a career. Okay. You know, because James Jebby used to own this store called Union. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's on 176 Spring Street. I used to hang out there all the time. His ex he took to his ex, there. Marianne, yeah. yeah, Wilkins, Vito. So Vito and Matt. When I first started going there, it was Vito and Matt, Matt, um, Matt Priceless, and then Wilkins and Ricky Sayas took Wilkins free us and Ricky Sayas take it over, and you know, I met them and um, they became good friends, and um, I hung out there all the time. So that's also was my fashion school, was um, hanging out at um, at Union as much as I could. I'll never forget my first time in Union. I got so many stories. But anyway, to answer your question, yeah, like... um, You were part of the community. From 1999. And they saw your ability. Did you pursue the job or were they they reached out to you? I've never had a LinkedIn LinkedIn or... um, Right. Then or a resume in my in my life far as post retail. Right. They um they hollered at hollered at me in October of twenty twenty one. Julian Kyle, like, hey, you know, let's get on a can we get on a call? And um we get on a call and like, yo, you know, would you be interested in being creative director of Supreme? James is really into the idea. What are you thinking when they say that? I was just like Pretty un, unbothered, just like oh, dope. Really? Yeah, I was like dope. You know, Supreme's a dope brand, right? Incredible, incredible, incredible yeah. brand. Yeah. Um. For me, this stuff isn't that important. What's important is like my family. My, Fashion's not that important. No, it's like it's 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 important, but it's not. It's like we're not saving lives, you know. Sure. Um, but. It isn't, you know, aesthetics and design and when it really harnesses and properly harnesses and um, supports culture and community and tribe, it is really important. And actually it can save lives. When, But a lot of it isn't doing that. Right. You know, so then, but for me, when I got, when they were saying that, I was just like interested. You know, I was, Denim Tears is going great. Um, I had a, I was, I was art director at large for um, Stussy. Um, and my career was going great, you know, doing me and Ace, I still was doing No Vacancy in with A-Side and Brock. Me and Virgil had stuff running. Oof. Um, so I had no shortage of work. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, but they, they, I, I believe Denim Tears, not believe, they told me it's because of Denim Tears. You were there two years, Supreme. Year and a year and a half. So, uh, was the first year cool? Um, nah. It was pretty much. Um, 
it was pretty like. A struggle from the beginning. Really? Yeah, yeah. And in what way? Things start to. You know what's that game where like the things pop up and you gotta hit them? Whack a mole. Whack a mole. It was a whack a mole. It was a it was a whack a mole situation. So they weren't allowing you to be the creative person you wanted to be. No, not 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 at all. Um, you know, James Jebbia. You know was the creative director of Supreme. You even, know what I mean? Even though you had that title. Yeah, but, but he, you he's know, he's obviously gonna And then so he couldn't he had trouble letting go. Mm. Um I think or in insecurities letting go. Mm. You know, I can't I don't want to cycle lot. Well, actually I can't. I will psychoanalyze him. I know him. I know him. You know, I got to know him well. Um just trouble letting it go. Um and I also and the main thing you're going to hear throughout this conversation him and his um, uh, C-suite, they're all thoughtless about bringing in a creative director in general mm -hmm. and also bring, bringing in an African-American creative director and also bringing in an African-American creative director that has a brand called Didim Tears, which is why they hired me, that speaks about the plight and glory of African-Americans. You do. There's a tremendous political ideology in the work. Mm-hmm. Denim Tears and what you were trying to bring forward at Supreme. And I'm curious, I want to touch on that a little bit because you talked about your art background, your fashion background. Yeah. But there's clearly a political uh, background and care in your mind. One of the pieces I loved at Denim Tears, you got it says late capitalism on the shirt, and then it's and then it's uh, cotton, field. cotton fields. Yeah, because America was built. Um, America and capitalism, sure. not just America, you know, the UK, um, France, um, um, so the whole European Union sure. and America was, capitalism was pretty much jump started by the cotton, for sure, uh, sugar, um, and the people, in, indigo, and, and, the, and the people, and the yeah. creation of people as wealth. Yes, yes. So, you know, my, my purpose with Denim Tears is um, clothing's currently, if I if I lived in the 50s or 60s, I probably would have been a writer, mm. you know, being left in the dust by James Baldwin and Franz Fanon, uh, but I still would have tried. Sure. And um, if I lived a bit later, I would have maybe been a painter. Okay. Getting left in the dust by like Basquiat. <laughs> Bearden. And all those guys, you know, and, um, but... I didn't grow up in those times. So I grew up in a time where the most important expression to, one of the most important expressions to young people and humans is fashion. Yeah. Because of consumer consumerism, capitalism has pushed fashion as a vehicle to make money. You can try to Trojan horse inside of that to get messages out. Which is what you're doing. Trying, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the Arthur Jaffa collaboration Jaffa. it's pronounced Excuse Jaffa. me, Jaffa. yeah i know him yeah, yeah. long time only as aj aj right? yeah. i know his real uh, yeah. name i remember the first time first time i talked to him on the phone he's like call me years ago he's like just call me aj man yeah hell yeah hell yeah, yeah. me him and greg tate greg yeah i'm currently reading um Flyboy and the buttermilk <sighs> wow I mean, incredible the incredible. essay on basquiat oh i mean every <laughs> sentence was amazing guys fucking genius painter um, painting with work like for sure those but are it's, no, it's musical. It's yeah. musical. It's, you can it's, hear it. So, what a loss. It's incredible. So you and AJ were collaborating on, tell, tell us about it, because this is where you're getting into the images of Whipped yeah. Peter, right, and other things, right? Yeah, yeah. So what were you guys doing? So my job, you know, the thing is, a lot of people don't understand, and rightfully so, what a... Crave director does. Crave director is no different than like a director, Martin Scorsese, George Lucas. Like George Lucas didn't do all the special effects. Right. He directed people and pushed them to what he wanted. Martin Scorsese doesn't edit his films. A woman's edited most of his films. Right. So on and so Film, forth. Right. He, you know, you assemble teams and guide them. Mm -hmm. And you give them mood boards and your vision, copy, maybe you write the script. 
Maybe you write a paragraph, you work with a writer. It all, same thing in fashion. So my first, um, this AJ project goes back a year and a half. My first month at Supreme, the way they work, they have these meetings. So the meetings like artist collaborations. So, you know, the way they do it is, in my opinion, quite counterintuitive. They create this gladiator dogfight of all the designers have a stack of paper and they put in their ideas. So everyone's trying to out. And so then they've interjected me into that where really as a creative director, I should be working with the team. And then we have one stack of all our work. That's how I work. That's how I like to work, where it's not against each other, it's together. But anyway, I put out Arthur Jaffa and James Jebbia goes, man, I mean, if he he's so cool, his arts, he's one of the best artists alive. Yeah. yeah. If he would be down to work with us, which I doubt, I would love to do something with him. So then part of Creative Director is your black book. Yeah. So it's not just guiding design, it's who you know. It's yeah. part of why they hire you. Yeah. And I kind of know everyone. And um through my journeys in working for years, you know? And, or I'm six degrees away. Yeah. So I hit up AJ, I'm like, hey, would you be interested in doing um, a collaboration with Supreme? And he's like, if you weren't involved, um, no, but you are, so I'm down. And so, um, cause me and AJ have worked on stuff before in the past when I was at Ye Yeezy. Um, anyway, he, um, when I was the brand, di brand director there and then, um, he tell, I go back and tell James, AJ's down. Amazing. Then, Hey AJ, what we want to do to artists. So the w Supreme has different pillars of what they do. So they have the artist collabs where they make a tee, a hoodie, maybe a coach jacket, a couple pieces of clothing, and then they do their art on skateboards. They just released Mark Leckie, who's actually a white artist that's on the same, it's also represented by Barbara Gladstone, okay. who they switched out AJ's work for, okay. switched out his slot that he was supposed to come out. Um, so AJ presents La Rage, which is um, his avatar, which is a version of Hulk, but Black Hulk with a fro, gold teeth, tattoos, and it represents his inner rage of living in a white, that's, what, that's why this is all ironic, tragically ironic. His inner rage of uh, being a black man living in a white, patriarchal, hetero world, which is the Western world. Deep. And um, then there was Gordon, which is St. Gordon, which is the slave pose like this. Whipped Peter Gordon. Free, yeah. We, we all know this image. His back is crazy yeah. whipped up. Yeah. yeah. Then there's another one called... We don't care about your past. These are images that AJ is giving to you of like, this is what I want to build Supreme. on. To, well, you yeah. and Supreme. Yeah. Like, this is what I want to build on. Yeah. And then he gives us, we don't care about your past. I just want our love to last. And that's, um, it's not a tri tech, it's two images. And it's one image of from Mississippi, which is also ironic because some black men were recently kind of lynched in Mississippi yeah. by police. Yeah tortured and beat in 2023, mm -hmm. one shot in the mouth. But this is in Mississippi, picture of two black men lynched um, who are accused of rape. Um, and they are lynched and there's a bunch of white men standing around them smiling. Yeah. And there's loads of this imagery yeah. that um, is out there. There's a book called Without Sanctuary yeah. that's on the cover, has a lynched black man that you can go into any mostly white owned bookstores and buy. There's also AJ's um, book called Magnum, which has Gordon on it, which you can buy off Amazon, which is owned by a white man. Yeah. And I say that because there was a lot of talk about, why would you think that it'd be okay for a white brand to put this out? These images, this book without sanctuary is lynchings, and it's sold by white bookstores. So is that profiting off black trauma? They're not donating that money to sure. the NAACP. Sure. They're buying that book wholesale. They're making the margin, and they put in a cash register. So, but when AJ's coming to you yeah. with whipped Peter slash Gordon yeah. lynching image, and what what is what are you saying? I'm saying this is the images. I am a bridge between the artist and the brand. Right. These are the images AJ wants to work with. What is said to me by the guy who's the final say, James Jepia? He goes, "We have to do this." He pointed at the lynching. 
Really? And said, this is important for people to see because it still happens to black people. That's a fact. He said that. He looked me in the eyes and said that. So we do it on hoodies, tees. What did you foresee the supreme customer thinking and saying when presented with, here's a hoodie, here's a tee. And skateboards. The, uh, and skateboards. Yeah. With an image of, because what, 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 what do you think is the end result there or the thought and the intention of the wearer? I think it's the same thing they'd say when Supreme released a t-shirt of two Catholic nuns, um, one with a cross in her hand, the other nun with her, her ass out and a gag ball in her mouth or when they've released uh, Dash Snow's artwork of human se- with his semen or on the cover of the New York Post of Saddam Hussein with glitter on it. There's another artist, I figured his name, there's a t-shirt of a, a crucifix um, floating in, in, so, ur- in urine. So I we, can keep going. So we can take... And, and, and so that's what I think. I was thinking the customer would... If the customer is intelligent... Yes. And if they've been following Supreme, Supreme puts out provocative art with artists. Yes. They just never do it with black artists. Really. Okay. So just, it's a provoc. I mean, like, it, and I understand the Supreme they've, audience is they've not- They've put out calendars that they've sold in the store with women masturbating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, there's 30 years of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Different types of stuff that people could say is provocative or inappropriate or misogynist or, you know. So I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't, I didn't think anything. I thought- I'm doing my job because Supreme wants to stay top of class and be impactful culturally. And Arthur Jaffa won the Golden Lion, which is the highest award you can win in the art world. He's a blue chip artist and he's one of the best living artists in the world and will go down as one of the greatest um, living American artists in history. So I felt like that's doing my job, Getting, getting, getting this artist to work with Supreme, that's doing my job. Okay. So that's what I thought. I just thought I was doing my job. I wonder what my reaction would be. See, let's say a 22 year old boy, typical yeah. Supreme customer, yeah. wearing a shirt with a black man whipped up, whipped Peter. Yeah. Wh- what would I say? Would I be like, mm. Yeah. Or I, I don't know. I might kind of jump a little bit. Yeah, fair enough. And you want that? Um, I want, so I've I've presented, and there's all kinds of stuff that I put out with the team through Supreme. I want to create clothing that matters. Mm -hmm. And sometimes for something to matter, it creates tension. Because here's the thing, I give you an example. I answer that question perfectly. So there's two black employees who had um, issues with this artwork coming out. Mm -hmm. Because Supreme, again, was thoughtless, and they didn't talk to the team and go, hey, we're working with this artist, Arthur Jaffa, and these images are visceral. Mm -hmm. We want you guys all to know. They don't do that. They're thoughtless. And that's what systemic racism or misogyny or dealing with uh, homophobia, anything systemic throughout those is thoughtlessness. doesn't mean they wake up and hate black people Mm. or wake up and hate queers or hate, wake up and hate trans they people. They don't think about not them. Think, and that's because of their privilege. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So do the Supreme hate me? No, but they were yeah. thoughtless about having an African-American creative director. Mm-hmm. And what that's that would mean. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. that's not like, you're a racist. You know, like James Jebbia said to me after I resigned, we had a four-hour conversation. He said, I didn't realize, he's like, I feel ashamed of this, but I didn't realize I had white privilege to ten, 10 years ago. So Until 10 years yeah. ago. Okay. So that he's a 60-year-old man that has a 30-year-old company that puts out a lot of black culture through their company. Streetwear. Mar- Martin Luther King t-shirts, MF Doom, Andre 3000, uh, yeah. Mike Tyson shirt, Dipset. I can keep going. Yeah. Picture of Prodigy when he was in jail with the words H-N-I-C, mm-hmm. head nigger in charge. Mm-hmm. Supreme put that out. Mm-hmm. So, and... He said that to me, and I said to him, James, do you think it's impo- not po- do you think that if you just realized 10 year, years ago that you have white privilege, <sighs> that there might be systemic racial issues in your company of 30 years? Mm-hmm. Do you think it's possible? Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, you're right. 
What about, what is the <clears throat> imagined or real conversation that you had? Was it two black designers who who resigned or one? There's one black, des- uh, he's a tech packer, he's not a designer. Okay. So he, tech packer is someone that takes the, the let's say a hoodie. Yeah. They make the CAD so you can send it to the factory for it to for the factory to translate it into clothing. Okay. There's no design in it. It's designed already. Um, he res- So here's the interesting. He he quit because he didn't like what no. was happening. No. No. Okay. So here's the interesting and tragically ironic part. So to answer the first question, James said when he spoke to this black employee, the employee said the same thing you said. What you know, Arthur Jaffa's art belongs in the museum. You expect to see that there. You go to see a museum. You, you, you ex, you're you going there and expecting to see that, which I don't totally agree with it. But his his plight and his issues with it are valid. As a black man and as a human being, his issues with it are valid. And I was down for the discourse. So that's it. And he said, if a third, imagine a 13-year-old kid comes into Supreme and sees that imagery. And then James goes, you know, that's what made me change, made me think of my daughter and my son. And then James said, that's why I never talked to you about it for four months, because I knew you'd change my mind. And he doesn't mean like giving him an ultimatum. No. He said, you changed my mind by me yeah. saying something, I don't know, poignant. Yeah. I said, James, all I would have said to you is, maybe the reason why this keeps ha- happening to black men is because the next generation never sees or learns what happened. Interesting. So they don't grow up thinking this is something we need to fix. So black you- folk growing up thinking that, white folk, no. Asian folk. Everyone thinking so this stuff keeps happening. So we you're need to fix it. Partly thinking, let's put these images in people's faces. Yeah, like George Floyd getting a knee on his neck. That wasn't everyone's face, right? Yeah. I didn't ask to see that. Yeah. To but I mean, like yeah. we but we as black people traffic in those images, we think about them. They live in our I mean, I think every black person could name twenty videos that they have seen of this one, this one, this one who got shot or more, right? And maybe your 20 isn't exactly the same as my 20, but we all could do, and most white people could not do five. I could name, forget 20 videos, I could name people I know that have been murdered. Right. Murdered by black people, murdered by police. Right. But you want, but they are, but you I've had guns pulled on me. I've had police pull guns on me. But we, we see a bunch of people online, at least, saying, Tremaine, I don't appreciate that you're going to put these lynching images out. Yeah. Da, da, da. But you're saying, no, I want to put them in their faces so they have to think about and deal with lynching. We're not going to not talk about it. We're going to make you think about it. That's That's kind of where you're coming from. Uh, it's more layer. It's more layered that for me because it's like, also, yeah. To create, t- see, AJ's work creates tension. Yeah. Right, and tension creates thought because this tension is happening. So let's say you, you bend down and there's some tension. You're like, like your knee, like you're telling me before. Sure. You're like, I need to go get it checked out. Without any tension, it's like nothing's there. So the tension creates discourse. Mm-hmm. That's important to me, and it's not my issues. My, I'm a human. Like Chaos once said, "I'm human before I'm a black man. I'm human before anything." So I care about the plight of all people, and I like exploring that those plights and the glory of all cultures through clothing and fashion. That's what I do. That's what I'm proficient at. And designing sportswear and ready to wear menswear. That's what I'm do. Some say I'm great at. Some people say I'm great at it. That's up for. That's up. I just make sure that I care about and like the stuff that I put out. So with this this um, potential of this coming out, um, it was to express AJ's art, help push AJ's art to the world because the art world is really small mm-hmm. and it gets bought up. Most of this art gets, that's the funny thing. People say well, white people profiting off of, who do you think buy AJ art? Right. For sure. I'm probably one of the only black people in the world that owns his art. For sure. And he gave it to me. Most most buyers are white and church. Like that piece, I don't care about your past. I want to love the last. Two people own it in the world. Me and the owner of Caring Group, Pino. Mm. Two people in the world. If you, AJ's 
galleries owned by a white woman. Before, the gallery he was represented by that was owned by a white British man, Gavin Brown. He's now on, he now he now works with Barbara Gladstone. So people want to talk about profiting off of Black Plain. All of AJ's work, half of his money goes to them. Mm -hmm. That's most artist deals. I don't know his deal, but half of his money go to them. Most artist deal it's fifty fifty with the gallery. Damn. And the gallery are they donating the funds to NAACP? Damn. Are they donating it to Africa? Are they donating it to Jamaica I did Queens? Not realize galleries were taking fifty percent. God damn. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so living artist work, that's man. how you think they stay open. So my thing with that is, so then my thing is like, these amazing stories that AJ tells, pushing that into popular culture, that's changed. Cause I don't know many kids from where I'm from go to galleries, Barbara Godstone Gallery, if they even know they exist. But they know Supreme exists. And also the tension that creates that people have to deal with this thing that's still happening. Trust me, the day that black men stop going through and black women stop going through what they go through in America, which leads all the way back to the first slave ships that came here in For 1619, sure. yeah. I'll shut down denim tears. And I'll just design fun clothing that has nothing to do with nothing. But until then, I'm doing denim tears because they, they're literally banning 1619 book in schools in the South. Yeah, they're yeah. banning it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Banning it to learn this history. They're saying it's not true. They're saying it's lies. They're saying that black people benefit from being slaves. Yeah, yeah. And this is your way of speaking back to all of that. Speaking for ancestors, back to people who want to argue with us, all of that. But also, it's also Supreme was choice. Supreme wanted to do it. I was doing my job. I said, hey, you want to work with Arthur Jaffa? Yes. Made this is happen. the work he wants to do. Made cool. Happen. Yes. Let's do it. The, the and you thought it was a good idea because that's where you come from as an artist. But I, I, Yes, but my, my thing is a, like a cornucopia of ideas. So one minute I'm putting forth Fiona Apple, doing a Fiona Apple collab and an AJ collab or the MF Doom collab or us doing a collab with... Um, Let's do Andre 3000 artist tea. I'm all over the place. Sure, sure. It's not just of course. that. Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, and this is not the situation. There's several situations. So I go to, I, so I said that to James, and he's like, you're right about, well, maybe this is why it keeps happening. Because kids are not seeing and learning about it. He's like, you're right. And that's why I put up that text on the gram where he's like, it should have been AJ. Because my whole thing is, if they didn't want to do it, they ha why just go on for a year and a half? And then when you decide not to do it, why didn't no one talk to me? Why? Because I'm black. They were dancing around me. You didn't want to talk to me. You got I'm on the C-suite. The C-suite's Aaron McGee, white woman. West, white man. James Jebbia, white man. Julian Kahn, white man. And Kyle Demers, white man. I'm the only black person in the C-suite, and yet... I'm the creative director, and no one talked to me about this project for four months until there was a meeting where someone put out Lauren Halsey's work, another black artist in the same canon that works out of California as right. AJ, and they said, Tremaine, do you think you should work? we should work with her? And I said, I think we should figure out what's going on with this AJ thing first and really think about do we want to work with artists that tell the plight of black people through Supreme? Because she's doing, she's telling the same stories in a different way. So that was part of your mission inside of the company. Let's get black artists who want to tell a story of black people into this mix. Not part, it was, it's part of, it was my part of it was to make Supreme continue the tradition of making dope stuff. Supreme put out Martin Luther King hoodies. They put out Malcolm X hoodies. You know, at the, at the time of Martin Luther King's death, Google his, um, how people felt about him. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Google how people felt about Malcolm X when no. he died. <sighs> I mean, white people were not feeling either of them at the time they died. Probably not that much now, but at the time you they know, died. You know, they've done Holly Selassie, Selassie. Google so, Holly Selassie and the controversy around him. They've done Holly Selassie clothing. So you feel, I can keep, they've done loads. So this fits the long term. Aesthetic. N NBA Young Boy Artist Tea, which I was against. Why? There's a, 
I got called by Julian. He was like, what do you think about doing a young NBA young boy tea? I don't think we should do it. I said, there's a video of him um, physically abusing a woman online. Um, you know, I don't know what's going on with that. I don't know. If, and then I said to them, if we do NBA young boy, then cool. We just doing everything and we don't care. We just focus on the artists. NBA young boy is an incredible artist. Um, and I'm not judging him by what, what's going on in the news. He's, you know, I know he's on house arrest now. He's for diff, you know, firearms and attempted murder charges and all that stuff. But it's interesting because AJ even said to me, he's like, does James Jebby listen to, listen to NBA Young Boy? Mm -mm. Because the music's like down tempo, depressed, and very violent. It's as more violent than my paintings. Mm. What's the difference? What's the difference? But here's the thing with Supreme, and this is where this is I didn't resign because of the AJ images. I resigned because of their thoughtlessness and their lack of response when I was trying to garner discourse. I said to them, hey, do you realize Supreme is the Michael from Macro of American society? How so? If you look at the Supreme artist t-shirts where an artist takes a picture with wearing a Supreme logo, 80% of them are black. When okay. you look at Supreme artist collaborations where they put an artist's art, a fine artist's art on a skateboard, they've done two black people in 30 years, Pope L and Ram L Z. They've done only a couple of women. Everything else is white, Man. as they say in woke terms, cis male artists. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I said that replays out American society. We like Mike Tyson and Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan and LeBron James, but in James Baldwin... And Arthur Jaffa, mm, I don't know if we're going to let that creep into popular culture. Now, you know, stop a white person or any person in the street and name 20 black directors. <sighs> name 20 black people. Name two black female directors. Oh. So a brand that leans so heavily on black culture from the fit of the clothing a, a pro, that's what I'm trying to say. We can do a t-shirt with a one in four black, known black men in jail than in college. So we got a t-shirt of prodigy in jail like this, and it says head nigger on charge in it. That's not up for discourse. That's not a problem. So why is this so visceral of something that, you know, AJ didn't create this painting. It existed. So, it happened. So, so part of, well, part of you, you talk about the thoughtlessness. Part of your issue was that they didn't say to you, we don't want to do this anymore. That's it. Why Why did it get canceled? Behind, it was secretly behind your back. Why did that the AJ project get? So here's the thing. Because that's the you core see, of why you resigned, right? Because that, uh, Actually, I, I resigned because I had a big part of it was also like the black employee who, look, so let me finish. And, and like I think I want, I want people and you to, you to deduce why I resigned. But based off my, what I believe are the facts and my experience. So the black employee wrote an email about his, how he felt Supreme should have put out this AJ artwork. Is it even artwork? He questioned the validity of it being artwork. Supreme profiting off of um, black trauma, all this stuff. Valid points. Great discourse to have, you know what I mean? And there's no right or wrong in my opinion. It's and and and, not and or or. And um, he's, his feelings about it are just as valid as mine. Sure. As, you know, mine aren't more valid because I'm the creative director. You know, we're both black men and um, our opinions need to be heard in this corporate situation. So he spoke to James Jeb. He sent that email on April 1st. Mind you, I resigned in the middle of August. He sent that April, uh, email April 1st. And then he sent another email directly to me. Hey, can we meet? So I thought he's going to want to talk to you about this AJ project. So the gentleman, black gentleman comes to my office. And I say, hey, man, what's up? So Arthur Jaffa, he goes, oh, nah, I talked, I talked to James about that already. I'm good on that. I said, cool. And so then he goes, what I wanted to talk to you was, and this is on my mother's grave. He goes, how do you flourish and survive here when we work for a brand that makes that puts out black images and black styles, but there are almost no black people in the design floor. Okay. It's really hard for me. Okay, that's a good question. And I said, 
wow. And I said, the only place I've worked at where there was loads of black people was Grady's Liquor Store mm-hmm. on Farmers Boulevard mm-hmm. when I worked there. For sure. Everywhere else, I've been like one of the only black people there. Though actually, you know what? Mark, when I worked for Mark Jacobs, it was quite diverse. It okay. was quite diverse. And Robert and... You were Yeezy. Huh? Yeezy? That was not diverse? Mostly white women. Really? Yeah. Me and Ye were kind of only, only black guys. I would expect more black faces. Yeezy in there. was great because it had low. It was ran by women, so that was beautiful. Mostly white women. Okay. Like Yeezy was probably eighty percent white women, and then some other some good amount of white guys too. Okay. But there was a lot of was more women than anything. Hmm. They were there was one black woman, Maddie, hmm. working there. At my at my time time that I got fired. But you're you, there's not that many black creative people there, and yet they're constantly using black culture and black people to Supreme, sell products yeah. S- yeah. to to make the brand seem cool and all these sort of. So, and that's the funny thing James said to me. He said another thing that stood out from the conversation we had. He said, you know, you know my you know just like when I started Supreme, it was Jaquan, Chris Gibbs. Um, Chappie, they're all people of color. Mm-hmm. And I said, James, when you start a business, systemic, as it grows, the systemic issues seep in and mm-hmm. you have to be cognizant of that mm-hmm. with any brand. Denim mm-hmm. tears included. Denim tears, I got to make sure it's not a boys club. I got all types of people working for me, but I got to make sure because my natural thing is to defer to men. Mm. So I got to be cognizant. Gotta check yourself. Check myself. That's what being woke means. I am aware of my biases, right? My blind I'm, spots. I don't, I don't even subscribe to the woke thing. I'm just compassionate. But you're aware I have this bias, so I have yeah. to be conscious of making sure. We all have bias, yes. Of course. I'm including women, uh, you know, and not just listening to men. Yeah. And I'm also, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a black hetero male, so... Including including pe- people of different sexual orientations. For sure. You know what I mean? That have the ability to do do what I need done to to um, successfully put out clothing. You know? And not just have it just like a bunch of straight black dudes working there. Yeah. You know? So, and then he sa- I said that to him. And then he goes, you know, and just like when I said the thing about the, the, the heaviness on black artists, black musicians and and sports people, he's like, you know, coming up, Muhammad Ali, it was always about Muhammad Ali. And in my head, I'm like, James, what do you think Muhammad Ali would think mm. if he saw your workspace, the lack of diversity? Mm. That's what the fuck he fought for. Spike Lee, had a, had a spe- meeting with Spike Lee in my office. And what Spike said to my colleague who's black following the, the meeting we had with James and this other dude, Nick Atkins, he said, well, only black people I saw was you and Tremaine. We're all the other black people. Spike was in the office for only an hour. That's what this shit is about. It ain't about the image. It ain't about me being hooked until this image has to come out. No. It's about the diversity that I was told from the start that they were working on that never happened. They keep saying it takes time. I got my brand, a small brand. I got she Ashley right there. She black. She's from Jamaica. She's from Queens. I got Tatum. She's black. I got a white woman working for me. I got a black gay man working for me. So how am I able to figure it out? Y'all, y'all, y'all sold your company for $2 billion. You can't hire some external organization to help you get find not just black people, people of color and women to work here instead of the nepotism of Nick Atkins just hiring dudes that look like him, who's the head of design, Aaron McGee, so on and so forth. Just basically, mostly, Supreme has, the design has less than 10% minorities. That is a fact. Not 10% black people, minorities. So if you get into the amount of black people, right, there's a coat right now coming out that's red, black, and green bubble coat. So that this, red, black, and green means something. Yeah. So this is your critique, your main critique that Supreme is using black culture and not hiring black people and brown people. Other, not, You're not just black, but you're not hiring people of color. They do in the stores. 
but 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 this, but you that's your critique at the in head, the design in the design you're not and now that I resigned there's zero black people in the C-suite again that's so for you, 30 that, years there was no black people in the C-suite and it's back to zero th that's your critique because you had a collab with AJ that you believed in that fits with what your 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 deepest principles it's killed behind your back and there's no fucking black people here. And the black guy that complained about it quit because of the inequities in the company. Because he wanted the chance to design. And he also had issues, HR issues, about people being racially insensitive around him using words that I'm not even going to get into it. But it's, these are facts. This is documented by HR. He complained to HR many times about this guy, Tori, other dudes there, designers, and about his issues feeling racial insensitivity as supreme, and he quit. That's the tragically ironic about it. He's talking about racial insensitivity all over the board, not just Tremaine wants to put no, a lynching exactly. on his shirt. He's much more. And James Jebbia ain't showing up to his house. Only reason James came to my house and there was all this stuff and all these meetings is because I'm a person of note. Because sure. people like you will DM me and ask sure. me to come talk to the show. Sure. Because this like this thing gets twenty thousand likes, or Naomi Campbell reposts what Gabriella from Vogue said about there's no alleged systemic racism, it exists a hundred percent in corporate white America for sure. There's no such thing as alleged systemic racism, right? You know, and another the part you know like it was just even like the meeting that I brought up the Lauren Halsey thing, and we start talking about the lack of diver. I went in the meeting and I wasn't it veered off from the AJ thing. I just said. The lack of diversity is hard for me. It's getting really hard for me to deal with. You here. said that to them, right? To James and everybody in the meeting. In the meeting, it was the studio um, director, the head of design, Nick Atkins, um, two of the guys that work with the, all the art collabs, the head of merchandising, and we all had a discussion. And people, it wasn't I was the only person saying it. You know, people brought up brought up um, Diana Lawson. They're like, yeah, why didn't the Diana Lawson collab happen? Why didn't, you know, she's a black female photographer. She shot Andre for the t-shirt. So why, why, why didn't it happen for her to do a collab with Supreme? People brought up other things, you know? Other white, white people were like, some, certain white dudes in the, in the meeting were like, yeah, why didn't the AJ thing happen? We, we do need to fig figure that out. And, you know, this, that, and the third. So then... After that meeting, I get pulled by the dude that took over James' position, the new CEO, Kyle Demers. And, he, you know, he went to HR because him and Aaron McGee heard about the meeting. And instead of coming to talk to me, they went to HR first. And um, they went, you know, hey, that was the wrong forum for Tremaine to talk about this. I'm a creative director. I can't talk about diversity. And I, I speak with grace and eloquence. You know what I mean? Um, we heard it was emotionally charged and racially charged, and you chose the wrong forum to talk about all these things. I was like, oh, okay. And so I, I kind of, I played the chess game. I'm like, oh, really? Mm, sorry about that. I wanted to see how far this goes, right? See if they're going to patch it up, fix it. And so then, um, you know, it started spiraling from there. And then I, I you know, I, start, I brought up things like there's this, um, Designer Walter Van Berendock, who, when Virgil was alive, he attacked Virgil. Virgil had a collection where he had a teddy bear attached to teddy bears and uh, different types of animals, part of the clothing. And it's something that several designers have done in the past um, and their versions of it. And Virgil's was inspired by Marc Jacobs. And it was an homage to Marc Jacobs, who once was the uh, creative director of Louis Vuitton in total, right. um, the women's. And then he did men's stuff for a while, and then he hired Kim Jones. So Virgil was doing an homage to um, Mark, which many designers do. All designers do mm -hmm. homages mm -hmm. and uh, reference things. Directors do it. They reference things. Mm -hmm. um, and Walter attacked Virgil on Instagram saying he's a copycat, he has no talent, and all this stuff. At the same time, and he's a white man from Belgium, which Google Belgium's history with race. Mm. And um, at the same time, Walter was doing a collaboration with Supreme. 
This is before my time there. When I started working at Supreme, James Jebbia felt the need to bring that up and tell me, yeah, we were doing a collab with Walter, but when he attacked Virgil and came at Virgil, we canceled it. We paid him and we canceled it. I was like, oh, wow, man, that's dope. Virgil, Virgil would love to hear that you guys repped for him because we're all part of the same tribe. When I, while I was sick in the hospital, recovering, you know, it took me eight months to get back to work, Aaron McGee brought that collab back. So I, in April, I talked to Kyle and Julian about that collab. I said, hey, why are we bringing this collab back when it was canceled? Oh, yeah, that collab's not going to happen. But I'm like, it's, it's happening. And then I sent back, I sent all these um, Instagrams and articles. There was an article that uh, Ruba, who's a creative director, woman of color, wrote about it. The New York Times wrote about it. You could just Google. And a lot of the articles were like, there's racial bias in the way Walter came at Virgil. So I emailed that to the C-suite about, hey, you guys should read this stuff. And as a creative director, because we got a picture of Virgil on the wall. As a creative director... Being that this collaboration was canceled because of him coming at Virgil and because of the racial implications cited by all these articles, I can't stand behind this collaboration as it comes out. That day, Erin McGee, who's the VP of design, she went on sabbatical mm. instead of talking to me. She already was complaining about me using the wrong forum. This is James's number two. We never, She never uttered the word AJ to me. And when I, the day that I sent that, email she went on sabbatical to this day she's on sabbatical and so then that's where the you see where it's going so you got the vp of design going on a sabbatical who's been quoted by people that work for supreme as of last week saying that she finds this whole situation with me and supreme funny she knew the aj thing was going to blow up and that's why she went on sabbatical mm. aaron mcgee said this mm. i knew I, and you don't believe tremaine he's a liar Mm. So this is the stuff that's going on. This is all part of why, like, it's like, it's like secession. You mm -hmm. know, you got these, you got James, Logan, Roy, mm -hmm. and then like, um, <laughs> Julian is, um, Roman. Okay. The young, crazy uh, Kyle one. that became CEO kind of looks like James. He's Kendall. He's Kendall. Yeah. Um, and Aaron is Shiv who's kind of, she get into Shiv because she's a woman, which is true. You know, Aaron's very, she's very disgruntled because she never got the creative director position or the CEO position. And part of it is because she's a woman, because there are misogynists there too. My issues with Supreme isn't just race. Sure. It's misogyny sure. and hope of homophobia. Sure. And um, and she took out her her issues with Supreme on me. Um, and she's supposed to be my colleague, which is a shame. You know, she's a queer woman. So she's a, you know, she's a double minority, queer yeah. Yeah. And, a, and a woman, yeah. white woman. And then, um, I'm a black man. We should have been, we should have been allies. But there's a whole chapter in that book, White Fragility, called White Women's Tears, that people can read. Oh my God. But anyway, um, then, you know, there's another situation, just, to, just stuff that's not getting dealt with. There is this brand called um, there's this artist collective called Bernadette Corporation. Um, and it's ran by a woman. And we designed all this stuff. And one of the items said, illest pussy in the world, right? The stuff is made. It's about to come out in a week. And when we're shooting a lookbook, um, one of the couple of the models supposedly said, I'm not wearing that. I'm not a pussy, right? So James made the decision that he felt like guys would feel like, oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't put this out because guys would feel like a wuss wearing it. And I brought this up in my meeting with James. I said, James, that was an opportunity to talk to these young men that this is a female artist who's decided to use this verbiage and it's okay. And it has actually nothing to do with you. It has to do with her as a woman expressing herself. And it's deeper than just like talking about it. And it's, even if she was just talking about it in a sexual way, but there's, she's smart. It's like, it's subversive. It was pussy in the world. She's saying a lot. And it's about, you know, it's about women. And um, they canceled it. In the, and they canceled it in the, in the 25th hour just like the AJ thing in the 25th hour. And I said, this was an opportunity for discourse. And, you know, the week before, a male artist who we use a lot named Weirdo Dave, a hoodie came out that said, eat pussy on it. And that was fine. I wanted, You know what I mean? 
even after that, there's this a Melvin's collab where they're like, it says pussy on the back of the t-shirt. And I, I, the studio manager who's a woman's like, hey guys, I, I item just got canceled for having pussy on it. So why is this one okay? And all the white men in the room look at her like she's got snakes come out of their head like Medusa. <laughs> and they're like, hmm, I don't know. Because they have they have the privilege to be thoughtless about women. So, uh, all right, I, I want to switch gears yeah. for a minute because because yeah. I feel like we've 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 t we've gone fully through this. Yeah, cool. I want to talk about your Yeezy work. Yeah, sure. I, I don't want to talk about modern Yay. I want to talk about the work that you did with him yeah. at Yeezy because yeah. I think that as far as fashion, there has been some fairly revolutionary gestures made there. Right. And and some attempts to really push things in a novel direction. And I think it's really interesting the work that has come out of there. And yeah, I wonder if you talk some about working with him and some of the things that you guys achieved as far as creating very original directions in fashion. Yeah, I mean And Virgil was part of that group when you were there too. Virgil was gone by then. Okay. Um, I mean, I was actually with Virgil in Milan working on our collaboration with No Vacation and um, Off-White when I got the call mm. from a guy named Matt George, who was like the CEO of Yeezy, um, like one of the main dudes at Yeezy. And uh, he called me and it's like, yo, Ye wants to meet you. Okay. So I flew out the next day from Paris to New York to meet him. And then, you know, I started, um, rolled with him for a bit. Um, literally, I remember I flew to New York. He was working out of his studio. We were working there, worked for two days out of there. Then he's like, you got your passport? I'm like, yeah. Flew on, the, it was the Pablo tour. We flew to Grand Rapids, worked all day, flew to Grand Rapids, did the show, woke up in the morning, flew to Detroit, worked all day. And then I remember we flew from Detroit, me, Ye, and Rennie on a jet to Paris. And that was the that was the that was the trip that Kim got robbed. So then, um, oh, when Kim Kardashian got robbed in Paris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I didn't hear from him for a while, understandably so. And then he had his um, episode where he went into the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then I remember he called me. It's like good to hear from you. And he's like it's good to be heard. And he's like yeah, we gotta get back to work. And then we started working again. And for about uh, six months or a year, I consulted for him, and I was working satellite out of London mm -hmm. as a consultant. And then things came to a head. He's like, yo, if we're gonna continue working together, you gotta move move to um, LA. So then they moved me to LA, moved my stuff. I moved out of London. That was 2016. Moved out of London to LA. Started working out of the studio in Calabasas. Um, and I, so I was, I was I was in a rare position. I worked across everything. So I worked across the clothing, the music. So I started off as a creative consultant. and uh, The music too, uh, what albums were you there for? Uh, those five albums that came out. I was the creative director of, of those five albums. Um, they left me off the credits, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah. But um, actually, AJ was supposed to creative direct the whole. I put I showed, I put EA on the author Jaffa and... Um, I showed him death is the message, the message is, love is the message and the message is death. I showed him that. And then Ye wanted um, AJ to creative direct all five albums in the tour. And then, um, but it didn't happen. But eventually they worked together and did on the a video. video. Yeah. Um, yeah, I worked on all five of those albums. Um, not just me, you know, a whole team. Yeah. And really the creative director is Ye. Of course. I'm... Helping, you know what I mean? Helping facilitate. So can you talk about some of the... Maybe well, I worked across clothing and music. Okay. So my last, my my end title was uh, brand director of Yeezy and creative director of um, good music. Can you talk about some of the creative principles that were driving you guys? Because it was pretty hot as far as the music and the clothes for for a long period of time. So what, was, what were you guys thinking about? What was driving you to make this work that quite often was pretty great? Um, 
I think what was driving us? I mean, um, it was Ye driving us. You know, his 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 vision and all his influences. You know, that's the thing about um, what made what made Ye a, a great artist was his talents combined with osmosis, because that's how you become a really great artist is by looking to other artists and things and objects and things and bringing it through your filter and then putting it out. <coughs> and he was incredible at that. <coughs> and, you know, he had he had mentors who taught him, you know, probably his main mentor is a guy named Willow Perone, who's a who's an art director, creative director, artist, in my opinion. And um, there are other people, too. He learned a lot from Virgil, um, Don C. He had great people around him, Don C, visionary. Um, I've been Jasper, um, Taz Arnold. Um, so many people, Jay Z, Dame Dash. Um, so when you combine all these amazing people who have great ideas with someone who has all that talent and work ethic and drive, you know, you get you get those albums, you get a Yeezy, you get the sneakers, you know, Jerry Lorenzo. Um, so many people, you know, <laughs> men, men and women that he puts together, he puts in, he puts he puts together good teams. In a lot of creative endeavors. It seems like the the creators are thinking, what does the audience want? And then there's sort of, let's call it the Steve Jobs method of, we know what the audience wants before they know. We're not asking, we're not, Apple's not polling the audience. They are like, we are going to figure out what you want that you don't even know you want. And I think Yeezy was also like trying to hit a target that no one else could see. And, you know, to the audience to decide whether or not they hit it, right? Like- True genius tries to hit a target that no one else can see, right? Yeah. And it was like, that's what, we are leading the audience. We are not, we don't care about the trends. We don't care about, you know, what's going on. We're doing something original. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's no such thing as an original idea. Um, so, you know, once there's, once you get to a certain point in the human existence, it's more so building off what's been built. Like Jay Z has this lyric, like, "We didn't create the tire, but we made the goodwill. We made the good, good. We didn't create the tire, but we made the good year tire." You know what I mean? So, all the things that all artists do, they come from somewhere. The way you think they, there's no new ideas at all? Um, not that they're not new. They they come from somewhere. They're yeah. not just coming out of. So there's no originality. Everything is a remix or a shift of something? There's something in it that comes from, I'll use a yay, a yayism. He's Yay is like art is a thousand year painting and we're just adding to it. Mm -hmm. But sure. what you add to the painting comes from what you saw in the painting since you were a little kid. That's what I'm saying. You know? That art is a reaction to all the art I get, you've ever I get, seen. I example. So no, I'm not trying to bring it back to me, but like the cotton reef, which is a pretty popular one of my designs but to me it's not a design to me it's a form and the cotton reed come, comes from several places um one of them is this um theologist and philosopher named joseph campbell mm -hmm. and i used to watch it me and my dad used to watch him with my my dad the story the hero's journey hero's journey yeah, yeah. and so part of the i learned from joseph campbell is that the word the root word to religion is religio which mean which is Latin for to return to, so making the cotton wreath a circle of cotton, it's about returning to what started America, returning to the beginning of blacks in America, returning to the beginning of white supremacy and colon colonialism, all those things. So, is it an original idea? That's inspired by Joseph Campbell talking about it. It was also inspired by a funny Instagram that Kara Walker put up on Instagram. She put up, it was Christmas, Christmas. it was like 2017 or 18, and she put up an Instagram of a cotton reef on a door, and she said, Merry Christmas. And I felt that's kind of funny saying Merry Christmas and you have a cotton reef on your door. And I'm like, I wonder if she made that. And then I Googled, and you can buy them off um, Amazon. So then I bought some. And then I, ha I just had moved to L.A. and my apartment was empty and I was just staring at this cotton reef. And I kept it. My fireplace was not working. I kept it in there. And then I just kind of like seeing it every day after working all day or traveling the world, come back to my house 
And then I was like, oh, these cotton, it's the using processed cotton. I wonder if I can make these on my own. And then I worked with fabricate, fabricators and florists to make my own cotton reefs from raw cotton. And then I start building the idea. So you got an Instagram for Kara Walker, kind of joke. You got Joseph Campbell, Hero's Journey, the word religio, the return to. And then Levi's hollers at me like we want to do a collaboration. I'm like, cool. And I went to San Francisco and I had with um I designed an AI, AI file, which is a digital file of artwork of the cotton reef. And I said, this is my one, this is my idea. And if you guys are down to do it, cool. If not, I'm not doing collab. And they were down to do it. And I explained to them what it meant. And um, they loved, they loved, they loved the meaning behind it and how it looked aesthetic, aesthetically. And then so on and so forth. The rest is history. So I'm just using that as an example to say, no idea. Just don't just come out of, because, you know, the greatest computer is the human mind. Everything you see, smell, taste, hear, goes here. And that's why, that's why when you go off your gut feeling, you make the best art. Because the gut feeling is connected to here. And all the stuff you've seen and even maybe, you know, even the stuff genetically coming from your family's lineage yeah. and stuff like that yeah. is in there. Yeah. And you make, some, you make some stuff. And you can make something that is unto you rather than so it's new because it's, un, it's unto you it's it's originally from you but it is influenced by all these other things this sounds i mean others have espoused this philosophy yeah and it sounds like things that virgil has said or that virgil said um and one of you talk a little bit about what you learned just talking and being friends with virgil so much. Yeah, learned so much. Best thing I learned from V is just, uh, man. Yeah, um, yeah, we talk so much. Um, you know, my, ch I, you know, besides my parents and my grandparents, and some folks down at home, Georgia, my greatest mint friends and friends slash. Mentor is a side and Virgil, mm. you know. Um, that was a little rat pack there, and I learned, you know, Virgil's only a year older than me. It's not about age. A side's a little bit older than both of us. Learned so much from them, and um, you know what the the greatest thing I learned from V. Don't matter what anyone say. Um, that motherfucker had supreme confidence in the most trying times, people hating, da 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 He just knew, he knew, he knew what he wanted to do and that it was valid. And that, and, and that was the thing is like, we are the validation index, our little tribe, our little group chats, me, Virgil, and A-Side. And that, it wasn't just us, Benji B, Judah, you know, just all, you know, Martine Rose, Grace Wells Bonner, uh, Sam Ross from a cold wall. Uh, I could keep going. Skept like musicians and just artists. We are our validation index, not them. They need us. They need us. The most important thing is the culture that we carry the torch from, from the people that came before us. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, learn that. Learned that from him and A-Side. That's something we talked about a lot. And, um, you know, so much, man. Also, you know, I, 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 I fall in love and hang out with people that remind me of Tracy and Sherlin. Those are my parents. And their main mantra was compassion and kindness. And, you know, V talked about that a lot. And that's what um, attracted me to me, him, to him as a friend was... Um, you're super compassionate and kind. I think it's really, it's really brilliant. The whole was ten percent philosophy to just change it a little. Yeah, that's what Picasso did. Yeah, a lot of his stuff's based on African art. Mm -hmm. um, you can, you can, man, you could go, you could go through it. 
So they just changed it a little, you know, and um, Warhol, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, um, but some reason when it comes to a woman or a person of color, the critics really want to hone in on where your reference is from. This is part of what I love about Virgil's work that I can see the original and I can see the remix. Yeah. And you love that. So designing. It's, like, it's, it's yeah. like I can see the work, right? Like you showed your work and I like that. Yeah. So let's say, let me think of a beat. Let's say H to the Izzo. Yeah. Jay-Z song. Yay sample Jackson 5 song. But is that, it's not a remix, that's Brie Collage. Because he's taking that, the way he's pitched the vocals, the way he catches catches the beat, the way Jay rhymes on it, all that, it becomes something else. It ain't stealing. You know what I mean? It's Brie Collage. Brie Collage of Jay-Z's vocals, his cadence, his wordplay, of Ye's production, of the mixing and mastering of Young Guru, and you get this piece of art that has inspiration from something that came before it, you know? We think about like- And that's the same for making garments. Someone like Kanye, or think about Hank Shockley, you know, or, or Premier. I took four or five elements from different things that you may not know and put them together to make something new. Jay Dillon, man. Jay Dill. As opposed to, let's name it, for example, Puffy would take a very recognizable, a large, very recognizable chunk of something yeah. that we all know. That was art too, though. It was art. That's Warhol too. It's very Warhol ish. That, that, but that's it's not Campbell, even. That's Campbell's soup can. For sure. For sure. Taking that Diana Ross song and putting Mace on it, that's Campbell's soup can. <laughs> that's the Campbell's soup can. Sure. You've seen that in the you've seen it in the supermarket, but you didn't appreciate it. No, you didn't. So it, I'm gonna it, put it, it didn't look like art there. Yeah, but I'm gonna put I'm gonna take Diana Ross song that you haven't thought about in forever. And you see that see there. No, he I'm talking about I'm talking, he, about young, I'm talking about for the young people. But he purposely chooses obvious things. Yeah. yeah. Right? Where some of the other people we talk about, I mean, I think when I think about it in a design context, Virgil's not necessarily taking obvious things. And then you're like, well, of course he did all these Nikes. Well, they asked him to do that. Right. Yeah. Like that it was a product, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the same thing. Um I think he was smarter. With the the bricolage, the where the pieces are coming from and where they go, ready mades like Duchamp ready made for sure. And again, this is just me saying stuff that he said and other people have said. You know, he he loved the Duchamp ready made. Yeah, so That's think of Virgil, aesthetic. what he did with Jacob. He made a took the paper clips and made them into a chain out of gold or platinum with diamonds in it. Paper clip. You can read into that design. Uh, you could be like, oh. He just took paper clips and made it really expensive. Or you could be like, he took something that took fucking paper clips. We don't think about anymore, <laughs> or represents work, or you know, represents something to him. Or like, you remember in school, kids would make bracelets out of paper clips. Yep. And then, so then that's the childlike wonderment, taking something of a child's mind and then putting it in a different, putting the right thing in the wrong place. So taking something kids did and then putting it with Jacob the jeweler. And then that creates something new, new-ish, new, that makes you feel something. That's the whole point of art. It's the whole point of making a beat, making a cor corey pants, making a hoodie, is to make someone feel something. And sometimes the best way to make someone feel something is to harken back to the past, but then also connect it to the modern times or, and or the future. Or do, you know, I guess when you do all three, you really hit, you really, you really, you really on to something. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for this conversation. Yeah. It's been brilliant. I really appreciate this. Nah, I appreciate you um, having me up here, man. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for a great interview. And thanks to you for listening. Torre Show gives you fuel to power your dreams because you can use your dreams like a rocket ship to blast you into a life you never imagined. You can make your dreams a reality. And maybe this show can help. You can find me on Twitter at Torre and on Instagram 
at Torre Show. Torre Show is written by me, Torre, and produced by Jennifer Brown. Our editor is Ryan Woodhall. Our booker is Claudia Jean, and we're distributed by DCP Entertainment. And we will be back next Wednesday with more amazing guests because the man can't shut us down. 